Okay, so welcome to our um, Bible study. I'm going to ask you to mute unless you're talking because we're getting some feedback. You know how to mute your uh, cells, otherwise I can mute you. Uh, and let's begin in prayer. This has been a rough, rough couple of weeks for us. Um, dear Lord, we ask you to come to us, come to this broken world. We ask you to be with all of our folks who are hurting, all of them that need your, your love and your care, especially, and all of our families that are experiencing any kind of struggles. We ask you to be with them. But Lord, our hearts break as once again, uh, our safe schools have been turned into places of tragedy and violence and hate. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with those dear souls, wrap them in your arms, those 19, 20 people that have gone to see you now much, much too early. We ask you to be with their families, the parents that are going home from school without their children. Lord, we, we can't even imagine the, the grief and the pain that they are going through. And Lord, help us to, to move through this and to find a way for this never to happen again. We say it every time, and yet here we are once again. Last week in Buffalo with some older folks of color, this week the youngest of our children. We, Lord, we don't even know where to start, but please mend the hearts of those that are evil, those that seek to destroy others. Give them healing. Give them ways to work through their struggles that don't involve ending the life of another. We ask you to send them peace, to send us peace, and to help us to work together for peace, peace at once, peace at last in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today we are talking about Isaiah 55, and it is called an invitation to abundant life. Uh, this, we're actually going to read the whole chapter. It's only 13 verses. Um, and, and in here, as we're going to read through it first, all the way through, and then we will break it down. Um, as we read through it, I ask you to listen to the renewal of some of God's covenants, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with David, and the extension to the entire world, uh, to everyone, to take those just from the uh, Jewish people, from those in, in Israel, to extend it outward to um, everyone that would be included in God's world. So if I could have someone read, maybe read one through five, and then someone can read six to 13. Chapter 55. I could read the first five. Okay, thank you. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Uh, is that it? No, oh, I've got two more verses. Yep. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel for he has glorified you. Okay, thank you. And someone to read 6 to 13? Myself. I'll read Pastor Rebecca. Okay, thank you, Pat. 
turn to the Lord and pray to him. Now that he is near, let the wicked leave their way of life and change their way of thinking. Let them turn to the Lord our God. He is merciful and quick to forgive. My thoughts, says the Lord, are not like yours, and my ways are different from yours. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. My word is like snow and rain that comes down from the sky to water the earth. They make the crops grow and provide seed for planting and food to eat. So also will be the word that I speak. It will not fail to do what I plan for it. It will do everything I send it to do. You will leave Babylon with joy. You will be led out of the city in peace. The mountains and hills and bursting into singing and the trees will shout for joy. Cypress trees will grow where there are briars. Myrtle trees will grow up in place of thorns. This will be a sign that will last forever. A reminder of what I, the Lord, have done. Okay, so what are your initial thoughts on hearing this, these words, this chapter, this, a lot of these are familiar words. Some of them we, we um, say in our worship at different times. Any words or thoughts stick out to you from this? It's kind of a reassurance like back on three and four, he says, listen, my people, I will make a lasting covenant with you. I will give you the blessing and promises to David. It's like reinforcing that he's there for us and offer of even though we may not always do what he wants, there's mercy and forgiveness there always. Mm -hmm. And then like on um, six, turn to the Lord and pray now that he is near. Let the wicked leave their way of life. It's just a reinforcement, I think, of, of where we should be and what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, Isaiah frequently like reinforces other learnings and talks about a lot of the history and and reminds the people, right? Remember Isaiah was written when people were in exile and people were disgruntled and disappointed and not sure where they were going and if they would be able to stay together as a people. Um, so a lot of Isaiah is written to build people up, to remind them that God has not forgotten them, that they are God's people and um, they should um, you know, stay the course, uh, not get frustrated and a reminder that God is with them always. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, so I'm going to read a couple verses and then we'll talk about those verses. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Here it talks about things that might not satisfy and how we might be longing for, for something. Um, what, or is there anything that comes to mind when you think about things that, that we've lost and that we may not have, especially over these last couple of years, um, uh, you know, we, we've lost some things. So what, anything come to mind that, um, you know, maybe it's not stuff we can buy with money, but things, what kind of things do we feel that maybe we're at a loss about? Not being able to have fellowship and gathering together, um, more aloneness, 
Yeah. And that's, you know. Um, a huge loss for everybody. And like he's, Isaiah is saying, why spend money on what does not satisfy? And, you know, everybody has their own way of, I guess, handling things. But it's like reminding us, you know, are you going to go out and buy all sorts of fancy jewelry? Is that going to make you better? Is it going to make you satisfy, say, this loneliness or whatever is the issue? Mm hmm. It's like money can't buy happiness, right? Amen. <laughs> and money is the root of all evil. <laughs> well, sometimes I joke and say, I'd like to try. I, I would be good with the money. <laughs> I'd put Which it to the computer. computer. But um, yeah. It's sometimes we try to buy our way out of stuff, right? And when we were deprived from going places, and, and I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, it was getting used to the fact that beforehand, you could just run to the store anytime you wanted. You know, I need milk today, I need eggs tomorrow, I need this, I need that. You never thought about it. Oh, I need to go get a pair of shoes or socks or whatever you needed. You just went and got it and you didn't think about, well, maybe I should only go once and, you know, you went as many times as you needed to go. And you maybe stopped at four different stores to get things you needed. Maybe one thing, one place, something else. You didn't think about it. But then as soon as COVID hit, all of a sudden we were forced to, first of all, prioritize and say, what do we really, really, really need? And then secondly, kind of strategically think out, well, I only want to go to one place. So where can I go that I can get what I need rather than hopping around to in and out of 12 stores that might expose me that many more times. Um, and that's, that's a, like a loss of freedom, you know, loss of, of how we're used to doing things. Um, and, oh, and this is along what you're saying, Pastor Rebecca, um, before all the COVID and stuff, there were a group, a few of us from, you know, friends, and we went in a couple of times into the city, we saw beautiful, and then we saw something else. And then during the winter, they opened up, I think it's downtown off of the High Line. Um, I think it's called Island in the River or something. And they built this, has anybody seen it? And it's they put these things in the water and they built this whole big park and there's a, I think a stage there. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that would be so great to go. You know what, with all the shootings and stuff, I'm saying to myself, I'm not going near any of this stuff. Yeah. I'm going to stay away. There's no reason. So and we didn't to... think a thing of it when when we went in to a show and we then went out and had something to eat, came home early, it was, oh, yeah. it, we didn't think anything of it. But, you know, now I say, oh, you know, what do we have? Yeah, it's a lot scarier. Is it worth, now, is it right? worth taking a chance is what I'm saying. And that's something we have to, that's a real struggle. That's a real struggle that we have to think about, not only with, the virus still around, but with safety, with, you know, violence and, and where, you know, and if I go somewhere, you know, I, I mean, even with, you know, th these shootings, who, who thinks when you go to a supermarket that you may not come home, you know, you know, you run to the store and, and that's the last thing you do is somebody doesn't like the color of your skin. So they shoot like, you know, it just doesn't make sense. It's just hard to wrap our heads around. You know, these little kids that went off to school happily yesterday morning and parents never saw them. You know, it's just, it's just very sad that so many of our, I guess, things we took for granted, our, our, our freedoms and our, um, 
blessings that we had are, are really things we have to struggle for now. And it's, and it's rough. But, uh, you know, when you look back at Isaiah, that was written how many thousands of years ago? And it was happening then, too. Different, different twists, different kind of thing. But they, they were dealing with loss and they were dealing with um, struggling as well. Um, so unfortunately, it's nothing new, but that doesn't mean we like it or, or we need to accept it. So let's look at three to six. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So what is, is Isaiah telling us that might be a solution for us? Well, in the third verse, the end of it, he says, I will make a lasting covenant with you and give you the blessings and promise. I will give you the blessings I promised to David. Right. So even if we feel like we're going astray, we have to remember that there's a covenant and they're going to, Isaiah says it's going to be kept too. Right. You know, no matter what we do, there's a covenant that will not be broken or we'll still get the blessings and promises. All right, but what, what is at the beginning of verse three, it says there's some direction. Incline your ear, come to me. Listen so you may live. How, do, how can we incline our ears to God? By if there's a sign, I and I don't know what I mean by a sign, but I don't, I don't know how to explain it. But we have to pay attention because God is always sending us a sign or a signal, like to bring us back to where we should be if we're gonna if we're going astray. Right. I don't know. Yeah, God is continually calling us to come back. Come to me, listen, come back, incline your ear to me, listen to me. Um, I want to be in covenant with you. I want to be in relationship with you, but you need to, you need to be part of it. You, you need to, to listen. You need to return um, to God uh, because he's going to restore those relationships, right? And not just for us. He had to talk about the whole world, right? All the nations he's going to draw back, right? Not just the people that already know him. For the, you know, but everybody's, you know, going to be drawn um, to the Lord. This, this holy invitation to, in, in my um, Bible, the head of this chapter is called an invitation to abundant life. And mine is headed, but I have a different Bible. I have um, the good, I think it's the good news. And it's a, a little bit, the good news Bible. Mine heads says God's offer of mercy. Okay. And mine says compassion of the Lord. Okay. But it really all means the same thing, just in different words. Yeah. How do we live? A, what is an abundant life, right? It's one that is an invitation to be with God. It's an invite. It's mercy, um, grace, 
love, compassion is is how we get an abundant life. Is there a, a particular practice or way or or place, I guess, where you feel most able to return to to God if you have strayed, or or some way that that you are able to listen best and and to appreciate that invitation to an abundant life? Say say that again, please, Pastor. That is there is there, um, you know, just describe a way that you might be able to return to God. Like, is there a practice or a place or something that makes you feel more connected, more more able to listen and uh, restore your relationship to God? I like to sing and listen to music. Okay, that's 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 a good way. Yep, music definitely helps us to be in a better place and to absorb and to hear things a little differently, right? Even to tap out the melody on my little two and a half octave battery powered piano. <laughs> okay. Yes, all as long as any joyful noise to the Lord, right? Right. No matter how we do it. We just had um, Music Sunday at um, St. Peter's. It was awesome. We had all of our musical groups uh, performing in some way. It was just so wonderful to have all that music back. We had our brass. We had our two choirs. We had our bell ringers. It was wonderful to hear the many ways to make a joyful noise to the Lord. What are other ways that people maybe find And now that I have the time to read Bibles, I enjoy opening it up and reading a few verses or a few chapters. Right. Some people have a daily practice of it at a particular time, morning, maybe um, afternoon, evening, whenever it's into their schedule that they set aside a particular time to read scripture or read uh, one of the many devotional books that, that are available around. There's some wonderful resources. Um, I know there's even a lot of apps on your phone that will give you a daily reading and a, a little bit of an explanation about that. Luther Seminary has one. If, if you're looking for an easy one, free one to get, it's called God Pause. And it's from Luther Seminary and it's free. You just sign up and you automatically get it emailed every morning. And it gives the, they go through the week, all different um, scripture from the Sunday. So they'll talk about the Psalm. They'll talk about the first and second reading, the gospel. Lots of times they will bring in a song, one of the hymns that they suggest for the day. But it's a short little verse and then a little bit of words and a little prayer about it. So, you know, something like that, even to stop and pause and, um, you know, think about God. Um, we all have different ways um, and not one way works for everyone. Uh, there's nobody that can tell you one way is best or whatever you what works for you. It can be sitting by a lake or, or the ocean and just closing your eyes and feeling the, the breeze and smelling the different smells that come from nature and come from being at those kind of places. Uh, I know when I go to the ocean, it always reminds me of creation and, and different smells, and it just it brings me peace to be in a place like that. But for other people, it may be the mountains, or or they may be happier in the middle of a busy street. I don't know. Um, but wherever you know, wherever you find um, your calm, your joy. Um, one thing makes me glad I didn't memorize more verses than I did is all the different versions that exist now because in some of the hymns that have been updated 
and the version that I'm reading from today, uh, I can substitute the V's and the thou's and the F's he doeth. And right. revert back to the King James version I read as a child. Right, and and it's um, you know I think often it's helpful to read. We've done that before in other Bible studies where we'll read the same passage in several different uh, translations to hear. I mean, just hearing from the different translations here, just the title of the chapter. Right? right, there were three or four different titles, and that's just the title of it. Much less going down into the verses. Um, but you know, it's it's again because. These were written in other languages that, you know, they came from uh, Hebrew where we get to the New Testament, Aramaic and Greek. Some of these languages do not translate word for word to English. So when the translators saw this word, they had to make choices sometimes. And based on the circumstances, they tried to make the best choice they could, but it also was influenced by the time. So like King James, they obviously, um, did, um, you know, they put in all of these and thous and shalt and because that was the language that people spoke, right? Now we don't speak like that. So the, the more modern translations have our, um, our um, the way we talk, which is very Lutheran because that's one of Luther's goals was to translate the Bible into German, which was the language of, of his country, so that people could understand it. So the, the more accessible we make it, um, the better it is, and the more approachable it is to more people. Um, so let's look at verse 7. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So again here, talk about returning, talk about pardoning. Um, maybe how have we maybe wandered or forsaken wandered off that we might need to find our way back and return to God. No. I've I've been uh, guilty in my adult life of several times taking rather long sabbaticals from the <laughs> church um, for what unbe unbeknownst reasons. <laughs> so sometimes I attribute it to the fact that I grew up as a PK and I had religion kind of shoved down my throat for many many years. Yeah. Um, and it was just. Uh, a silent rebellion, if you will. Um, sure. other, other times, I think I didn't want to get my butt out of bed on a Sunday morning to go to church. So whatever, whatever oh. it was, oh, yeah. um, you know that that's that's not the uh, that's not the the important thing here. It, it just that I, I kept myself away um, electively from mm -hmm. going to church and and all that was involved with it. Um, invariably returned. Uh, for whatever reason, this last um, hiatus um, prompted a return after I had a heart attack to, <laughs> to come back to church for uh, lots of different reasons, and and it wasn't um, it wasn't you know my church or anything like that because I actually started back to church by going to uh, my wife's church, who's Roman Catholic. Um, because I couldn't drive, I had to, you know. So I, had, if I wanted to go to church, I had to go with her, and then eventually made my way back to Gloria Day when I was able to start driving myself. But um, I, you know, different different things cause different people to do different things, and uh, 
you know, certainly having a life changing event is, is a, is a big reason to, to come back to, I just call it church, you know, faith, whatever, God, you know, put whatever moniker on it you want, but um, it's just, uh, I never really turned away from it. I just, it just, it was always there. It just wasn't at the forefront, I guess. It just, um, whereas now it kind of is for. It's moved down on your priority list, right? Yeah, well, actually, the church and faith and all of that's moved way up on the priority list. The, uh, the, uh, you know, yay God, thank you God, whatever. I mean, you know, I'm still here to talk about it, type of thing. And, and I mean, I, I, I may be repetitious at times because I know I've told this story in different groups over the last five, six years. But, uh, you know, having what happened happen, uh, there's just um, there's there's no way to to not believe that there's there's something there that that's that's running the show so to speak i guess uh, you know, and just sitting there waiting with open arms for you to return to the fold with no questions asked and that that often happens to people that have either a personal health scare yeah. or maybe a scare for someone else in their family or um even things like, you know, I know 9-11 around here, a lot of people returned to church because they felt helpless and they felt they needed some guidance and, and something to hold on to. But it can work the other way too, that some people can feel, where was God? Like, ooh, God was missing. God was like, you know, after, after these tragedies that have just happened, there'll be some people that'll run to, cling to their faith and run to church and say, I need God to keep me, walk me through this. And, and, and I believe that my child or the teachers or whatever are, are with the Lord now because my faith is strange, is strong, but there's going to be other people that are going to say, you should have protected my kid, God. And why did this happen? And, you know, you let this evil happen to him. And there'll be some people that'll walk away. I have, you know, someone in my family that lost um their their mom to cancer and they used to go to church all the time and now they hardly ever do because they they blame god for taking her um so it can go you know both ways that sometimes a life-changing event can bring people back to god and sometimes it can push them away um and um i you know i, I know i remember i read um Rabbi, um, oh, what's his name, Kushner, I believe, wrote a book um, when bad things happen to good people. And I remember he wrote it about actually the loss of his son. His son was like five years old or something when he died. And how at first, even being a rabbi, he was so angry, so angry with God that how could this happen? And he was distraught. And then finally, as he worked through it, he he came to his own realization. Obviously, this doesn't work for everybody, but he came to the realization that he had to decide what kind of a God he believed in. Did he believe in a God that micromanaged everything and that maybe was sleeping on the job and let this happen to his son? Or did he believe in a God that gave us free will to make our own choices? And that's everybody, good and bad people make their own choices which leads to some very unfortunate things happening um but that a god that is with us to hold us up and get us through those times mm -hmm. and, and will call us back if we're the ones that stray or or make the mistakes so he finally came to the realization that he felt his god was was not the micromanager was the the bigger presence that was crying with him when he lost his child and that was walking with him to help him through it. Um, not a God that wanted these things to happen or let these things happen, but a God that was crying as they happened, that but standing by to support those that were hurt. And, uh, you know, and so sometimes we have to kind of work through that ourselves, what our, our, our beliefs are and how we think of God in our life. And here, I think Isaiah was, was trying to get the people to think of the bigger, the bigger picture that even if you make a mistake, and even if something horrible happens, and a lot of horrible stuff had happened to some of these people, um, 
through the exile, but that God is still walking with us, even though this bad stuff has happened, that, that God wants you to come back. And we need to, um, as I said, listen and, and come back. Um, and we need to maybe confess if we if we wandered and, and we've made mistakes and we've made errors. Um, but that we keep looking for God and we keep coming back. And, and as Pat mentioned earlier, that we'll be pardoned and forgiven and still wrapped in, in God's loving arms, even when we aren't our best selves, we'll just say. Um, but it's not, e is it easy to do that? It's hard, especially weeks like this, it's very hard to think about that. Weeks like this, we kind of want a God that will step in and stop these things from happening. Um, there was, a, there's a, um, I forget the name of it, there's a Matthew West contemporary Christian song that one of the verses um, has this person ranting about, this is happening and that's happening and, you know, people are starving and people are homeless and, you know, people are evil and where are you God and why aren't you doing something about it? And, you know, come on, you got you know, you got to step in and you got to do something. And God's answer is, I made you. God made us to be those agents, those agents of change, to be that, that person that stops the evil, that, um, that steps in to stop stuff to happen. You know, sometimes we don't we don't want to have to be the person. We don't want that responsibility. We want someone else to have it. But um, I know that when when I hear that song, it always kind of humbles me. Uh, maybe I could do a little more. Maybe I'm I'm not doing the all I can do. Right. So let's look at eight to eleven. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So how are God's thoughts different than our thoughts? Or are they? Do you think they're different? If they was wrong. One of the readings I looked at uh, was about uh, the reactions to the quail that God swept in off the sea when they were complaining about not having any meat. Right. And then right as they were eating, some of them got sick and died because he was displeased with them. So if you've read enough of the Bible... Old Testament, uh, you kind of wonder what goes on with somebody who can get angry and then just kill people off like that. I think that turns away a number of people that they're dipping here and there and don't have anyone to help bring it back together, even if they've been raised in a Christian household and say, look, this guy's just a little bit too touchy for me. <laughs> well, and that is why you'll find in some Christian churches, they barely talk about the Old Testament because they find that Old Testament got a little too harsh, a little too judgy, a little bit too much smiting and, and uh, destroying. Uh, I 
Because we like, you know, we like the warm and fuzzy, Jesus loves me, God, right? That, um, so does God see things different than we do? Uh, I'm almost kind of yes, getting the... Uh, go ahead, ahead Joe. I'm, I'm almost kind of getting the, the thought that um, my thoughts, not your thoughts, my ways, not your ways, um, a higher level. I mean, you know, the general population, so to speak, the people that that read this have their their daily lives that they're thinking about their their survival, their their, you know, being able to put bread on the table. Um, but but the Lord's thoughts are are of a much higher um higher esteem not esteem is not the right word um higher level um you know greatest good for all mankind type of thing um not that not that our thoughts of survival are not important but it's just that that his it's just letting you know that he's he's taking in the big picture right uh, right I mean, we can't always see that right we get involved in our own personal lives and our own thing and we don't see that maybe something that happens that might be not great for us, but it could be very good for someone else, you know, or it could be good for us and not good for someone else. Um, I don't know if, have any of you seen the movie Bruce Almighty? I think so. Great. <clears throat> anyway, it's with, um, what's his name? Is that the British movie? No. No, no it's, a, it's a it's a comedy. It's with oh my goodness. Was oh, that the one with Jim Carrey? That's the one, Jim Carrey. Yeah. So Jim yeah. Carrey gets mad at God and says, "I could do a better job than." I mean, I'm <laughs> greatly abbreviating the movie, but he, you know, he's trashing God and thinks he, you know, that God's not doing a good job. So he gets called in to to see God and basically tells God that he's doing a crummy job and that he thinks he could do a lot better. So God says, fine, go ahead. And he <laughs> might get to do all this stuff, right? So he's running around, parting the traffic and letting his, his Porsche go through it. And he's living the high life like a magic genie, right? That he has all this power. And, but the things he's doing, he's doing for himself, selfishly, right? So he he does things like he wants to make a romantic moon for him and his girlfriend. So he pulls the moon closer to make it bigger. Well, that causes like a tsunami somewhere and kills <laughs> you know, things like that, that he doesn't get that certain things cause problems somewhere else. And then he hears everybody praying and, and, and he just hears all this chatter in his head and, and and he has this website where it's like emails that come through and people are praying and first he's listening to them and he's hitting yes or no to to all these things and then they start coming in like there's file drawers full and and it's just overwhelmed with all this and finally he just hits yes to all he just doesn't want to deal with it and then as you can imagine all these ramifications happen like all these people want to win the lottery and so he says they all can win well if they all win they all get like five cents or something like they're <laughs> putting the money millions of ways right and so now the people are all mad because they won but they're not getting anything so all little things like this you know and and so he sees how okay maybe being god is a little bit bigger job than, than he had imagined and like peter said you gotta have kind of a more higher level view you can't just be looking at what's good for me as being the best because it might not be good for the others and i won't tell you how it ends in case you want to watch it but <laughs> he eventually gets the message and and realizes what god is doing and gives the job back because he doesn't want it anymore but um but it, it's an interesting and it's great to watch with like a youth group or kids because it, it kind of gives them that view that like sometimes we selfishly ask for things or want things and get very mad at God for not giving them to us, but we don't see the bigger picture that 
you know, it is involved in something. Um, but yeah, so it's not easy for us always to reconcile what we think is right with what maybe God is thinking is the right thing for everybody. Um, I mean, I think most of the time we can agree on the things that are wrong and horrible and, and shouldn't happen. But I, I think as far as when we get into things that we want, um, and it comes down to, again, things we want, things we need, making a difference there, right? Because uh, we don't need everything that we necessarily want. Um, and so remembering that God calls us into a, an abundant life and gives us the things we need, not necessarily maybe everything that we think we deserve or that we, we would like to have, uh, that there's a difference there in that. Um, and then the last two verses, for you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So what does, what does God plan for us? Peace and happiness. Um, good overcoming bad. Joy. Joy. As Joan mentioned, bursting into song, right? Um, Trees clapping their hands, right? All nature rejoicing, right? In in God and in, in God's works, in in the, in the wonders and the abundance, in the mercy, the compassion that God has for us, um, even if we don't deserve it, especially when we don't deserve it, right? Um, you know, and, and you know, we talk about being godly and, and godliness, but it's not an accident, right? We have to invest in, in time. It has to be intentional that we um, pursue a relationship with God, right? It can easily, we can easily neglect it and ignore it and brush it off. Uh, we have to be intentional about, um, about being in that relationship. And it takes work. It's work. Right? It's being will willing to spend time like this, time in study of scripture and, and talking about God's intentions, time together in community to uh, feel that love and compassion and mercy of God. So, any other thoughts on Isaiah? And the, um, the reading for today, let me just look up what next week is so we can have a heads up. Next week. Uh, let me look it up. June 1st, we're going to be in Proverbs. Talk about the wisdom of God. Proverbs 8 and 9, we're going to do some reading from. What's some of the wisdom uh, of Proverbs? Then we go into the Valley of the Dry Bones. After that, Ezekiel on June 8th. Uh, 
Then, as you all know, we're going to the beach in July. Then we're lining up um, all the pastors to make that happen. Um, same place, 9.30 Wednesday in the summer. And, um, That's starting the week of 4th of July? Yes. Okay. Not that you'll and if we really Go ahead, Joan. If we really would like people walking along on the boardwalk to join us, it would be good to have some chairs for them to sit on and a sign saying in clear big letters, welcome, come sit down and join us. Um, we do have a sign. But it doesn't say welcome, come and join us. Um, I'll have to look at it. We can maybe add that on. Um, and I guess we could see if maybe someone can bring an extra chair or something. We do have those benches over there. Um, but the benches are all the way toward the back, and most people that would approach and see it would rather be on the boardwalk side where they wouldn't feel well, they had to stay or would be interrupting something if they dropped by. Of course. Yep. I mean, no one wants to sit in the front. Well, and with, the, and with there, you kind of have to walk past everybody. It's a little awkward. Yeah. Well, um, if it's a circle, a circle kind of a person like there was many times. Uh, yeah. Just having some seats um, on the um, boardwalk, maybe saying reserved for you. Join us. Well, the thing is, I mean, yes, I love that idea. And if, if we were somewhere else, I will always, I always do that. I always tell the people we used to have outdoor worship um, when I was down in Long Beach, and people, some people stopped sometimes or walking down to the beach. And I would always tell the regular people to sit up front and leave the back row for people that wander by so that they would feel comfortable going there. However, this is a more practical issue of people schlepping stuff down to the beach. So I guess if anybody's able to, to grab an extra there and drive it down there with them, that's a good, good, good idea. We'll think about how we can make that happen. Uh, any other thoughts? And then we'll... Um, some of you tomorrow night and um